Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achena and welcome back to my OpenGL series. So last time we talked about vertex buffers, there's a link up there if you haven't seen that video, but there were some parts that we were missing to actually get our triangle rendering. And specifically the two major parts that we were missing were vertex attributes and shaders. Today we're going to cover vertex attributes. So what, what is a vertex attribute? So, so basically the way that the OpenGL pipeline works is we've kind of discussed lightly in the last episodes and we will have some kind of in-depth video on that in the future. But to put it simply, the way that the OpenGL pipeline works is that we basically supply our graphics card with data, we store some kind of memory on the GPU which contains all of the data of what we want to draw, and then we use a shader which is a program that is executed on the GPU to actually kind of read that data and displayed on the screen, more or less. And typically the way that we actually draw geometry is we use something called a vertex buffer. That is basically a buffer of memory that is stored on the GPU. So when the program, the shader, actually starts to read that vertex buffer, it needs to know the layout of that buffer. What is actually contained in the buffer? Is it just a bunch of floats which dictate the position of each vertex? Do you also have texture coordinates, normals, anything else like that? We have to actually tell OpenGL what is in the memory and how it's laid out. Because if we don't do that, then as far as OpenGL can see, it's just a bunch of bytes. It's the same as with C++, right? I mean, if, if I write a float and I assign it something, we know that the memory there is a float because I'm telling C++ this is a float. If I cast that to an integer by, well, if I cast it to an int pointer, if I take the memory address of the float and cast it to an int pointer and then dereference it, I'm going to get something completely different because it's interpreting the memory differently. That's kind of the same thing that's going on here. We need to be able to tell OpenGL the first 12 bytes are three floats, four bytes per float, and that is my position. The next eight bytes after that are my texture coordinates. I've got one float for X and one float for Y, or U, U and V, if you want to call it like that. We, we need a way to be able to tell OpenGL this is the layout of my memory, and that is exactly what this whole vertex attribute pointer thing can do for us. There's a function in OpenGL called GL vertex attribute pointer. That's what we're going to be taking a look at today. From the shader side, you also need to match the layout that you define on the CPU side, on the C++ side as well. And when we actually introduce shaders in the next episode, we'll take a look at a basic example of what that looks like as well. And again, I'm just starting off with really basic examples so that you can see what it is like in its simplest form, but as the series goes on, we are obviously going to ramp it up and make it way more complicated. I'm just kind of starting you guys off gently. All right, without just rambling on further, let's take a look at the code. So from last episode, we have basically a float array of positions here. You can see that the way that I've kind of divided it is that each line here is an actual vertex, right? So we have three vertex positions, we have three vertices. This is the X coordinate, this is the Y coordinate of our vertex on our screen. Now before I go on, I just really want to define what I mean by vertex, because people seem to get pretty confused with that and also use that word incorrectly. A vertex has nothing to do with a position, right? A vertex is just a point that is on your geometry. The way that most people think about them visually, obviously, is by its position. So if I draw you a triangle, you'll be like, ah, three vertices. But vertices don't, vertices are not positions, right? A vertex is not a position. A vertex can contain way more than just a position. So if you tell me, hey, I have a vertex, it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, that doesn't tell me anything, right? Because you're kind of implying that I mean vertex position. And yes, a lot of people do use it like that, but that's not exactly correct because a vertex can contain way more data than just a position, although it does usually contain a position. So I just want to make that clear. When I say vertex position, that's what I really mean. I'm not going to just, if, if I actually say the word vertex, I mean the whole blob of data that makes up that vertex, which again could include the position, texture coordinates, normals, colors, binormals, tangents, all of this kind of stuff, right? That could all be in a single vertex. So just the position, if you're just referring to the position, you should really call it position or vertex position. So that's why I've got this float here as kind of positions, not just vertices, because at the moment they're just positions. Although when I add stuff to them, I really probably should rename them. Anyway, so we have these three vertices here, and then we're generating a buffer, binding it, and then actually putting this kind of, or I should say copying these positions into this actual buffer that we've defined here by just specifying a pointer to them and how big they are. And that's it, that's all we're doing so far. So again, OpenGL has no idea that if you look at this code, we can clearly see, okay, so we have two floats per vertex and that is the X and Y position, 
right? OpenGL doesn't know that. It might seem obvious to you because you're looking at this code and you're like, well, how can OpenGL not know that? But what if I suddenly introduce a third kind of coordinate, right? So in other words, what if I want a three-dimensional coordinate system instead of two-dimensional like we've kind of got here? What if I do this? Well, then suddenly, you know, how does OpenGL know that I've actually got three vertices of a three kind of dimensional coordinate system instead of just one, two, three, and then kind of four and a half, I guess, of just two coordinates, right? Because if I was to rearrange this code, well then suddenly it looks like we actually have more than three vertices here, if you kind of stick to the kind of two dimensional rule, right? So what I'm kind of getting at is that we need to tell OpenGL our layout, and that's what we're about to do. So if we scroll down a little bit, once we kind of bind the buffer and we fill it with data, you don't have to do this before you fill it with data, you don't have to do it after, you can do it whenever, as long as the buffer is actually bound. That is when we can tell OpenGL what the layout of our buffer actually is. And the main way that we do that, if I just open up my favorite documentation website here, docs.gl, there are two kind of lines of code that we have to write. The most important one though is GL vertex attrib pointer, which is right over here, right? I'll click on the GL4 link and we can see what we have here. So it takes quite a few parameters in. We've got the index, size, type, normalized, stride, and pointer. Let's go through them really quickly. So the index is the index of the generic vertex attribute to be modified. Again, this doesn't make much sense if you don't know how this works. Basically, the way that our shader reads all this is by an index system. Picture it as almost like an array, but the types in the array might be different. So this is an index as to which attribute you're actually referring to. All of these things, by the way, are called attributes. So in other words, when I mentioned that a vertex is made up of more than just position, right? It might be position, uh, texture coordinates, normals, colors, whatever. Each one of those, like a position is an attribute, a color is an attribute, a texture coordinate is an attribute, a normal is an attribute, they're all attributes. So this index is just telling us, hey, what index is this attribute at? The reason I say this is because typically if we have like a position, for example, at index zero, we need to be able to refer to it as index zero. So let's just picture this, right? I have three kind of attributes. I have position, um, texture coordinate, and normal. I need to be able to say that I want my position to be at index zero, my texture coordinate to be at index one, and my normal to be at index two. So that when I kind of start reading stuff from the shader side, from the GPU side, and I go into that buffer, I can simply reference them by, hey, index two, please. And I know that that will be my normal because I've kind of defined that layout. So that's what an index is. It's just the index of that actual attribute in your buffer. Size here can be a bit misleading. It's the number of components per generic vertex attribute. You can see that it says here clearly that it must be one, two, three, four. So again, this size has nothing to do with bytes or like actual how much memory this, this occupies. It is, it's basically the count. So what I mean by that is when we specify the type here, such as for our actual vertex positions, GL float, this is how many floats we're providing. So here clearly we have two floats per vertex. So this size will be two because we're basically providing a two component vector that represents our position. If we switch to that kind of 3D coordinate system, as I mentioned earlier, we would be we would be setting it to three because we have three floats for this, for this actual attribute. All right, so type, as I just explained, is basically the type of data that we're providing. GL float is what we want. Normalized, this is a little bit more tricky. We don't really need to worry about this, particularly if we're, if we're dealing with floats because they already are normalized. But basically this is used for, let's just say that we're specifying a byte that is between zero and 255 because that's our color value. That needs to be normalized to be between zero and one as a float in our actual shader. And this is what will actually do it for us. So basically this is an example of something that you can do yourself on the CPU side, but you can also let OpenGL do it for you if you're lazy or if you're kind of, if you just want OpenGL to do it for you. So we'll be setting this to, to false or specifically GL false because normalized is actually a GL boolean, which is just an integer. All right, stride and pointer. This is where a lot of people get a little bit confused. So, so I wanna just be clear on this. Stride is, as the documentation states, the byte offset between consecutive generic vertex attributes. This is worded in, I'm not sure why they, why they worded it like this, but basically what the stride is, is the amount of bytes between each vertex. So again, in our example, now kind of made up example of we have a position, we have a texture coordinate, and we have a normal, let's just say the position is a three component vector, the, the texture coordinate is a two component vector or two floats, and then the uh, normal is, is three components once again, right? So we have three floats, that's 12 bytes, 
plus two floats for the for the texture coordinate. That's another eight bytes, so we're on 20 bytes. And then another 12 bytes for the normal, so 32 bytes. That is our stride, because it's basically the, the size of each vertex. The reason this is important is because if OpenGL, and the reason it's called stride as well, is because we, if we want to jump from one vertex to the next, so for example, I want to look up index number one, so from zero, zero is our first vertex, I want to jump to our second vertex, which is index number one, I need to go plus 32 bytes into the buffer. So if we have a pointer to the beginning of our buffer and I go 32 bytes into it, I should be at the very start of the next vertex. That is what the stride is, so just remember that. The pointer, on the other hand, is, as this states, an offset of the first component of the... <laughs> I don't even want to read this, to be honest. It's so confusing. Pointer is a pointer into the actual attribute. So, this is already inside the space of the vertex, right? So you're, you're, just pretend, don't worry about how many vertices you have anymore, pretend you only have one vertex. I have one vertex, and inside there I have position, texture coordinate, and normal. What is the offset of each of those in bytes, right? So for position, the offset will be zero because it's the very first, the very first byte of our buffer, the very first byte of our actual vertex is the position, right? Then we go 12 bytes forward and we, and we reach the beginning of the texture coordinate. So for my texture coordinate attribute, this value would be 12 because 12 bytes into it is where we begin. And finally, eight bytes into that, we get to the vertex normal, right? So 20 bytes from the beginning is my vertex normal. For my, so for my vertex normal attribute, 20 would, would be the value of this pointer. Now, instead of just writing generic things like 0, 12, and 20, because that can get a bit confusing, and not only that, but if you actually rearrange your layout or something like that, you'll have to recalcul recalculate it all manually. There are macros and kind of, uh, well, it, it really is a macro, called offset of. I actually demonstrated that in the arrow operator. If you guys watch my arrow operator video, which you should because it's important for C++, um, I actually kind of demonstrated offset of. I actually wrote it myself instead of using the macro, but the library actually, the C++ library and the C library provides you with an offset of uh, macro, which you can use to actually find the offset of something in a struct or a class. Uh, so you can use things to kind of, same with stride as well, you can use kind of macros and stuff like that to automate this stuff for yourself so that you don't have to just be putting values like 12 or 32, as I said, for the stride manually. I'm just explaining to you what they actually should be, but just hopefully this explains the entire kind of vertex attribute pointer function to you because again, it's something that can be confusing if you're just starting out, but it is actually really simple. And make sure that it's correct because if you get even one byte kind of out of place here, you're gonna get weird artifacts probably in your rendering or just a black screen or something like that. Okay, so back here in our code, we can finally use this now. So what I can do is with the buffer actually bound, that's important, I'm just going to write GL vertex attrib uh, pointer. All right, so again, first parameter is the index. Now, this is a really simple case, as I mentioned earlier, we just have positions. So first of all, we're, we only have one vertex attribute, so we only need to call this function once because we're, we're just specifying a single attribute here. The index, of course, will be zero because it's the first attribute. The size, remember the size is the component count, not anything to do with actual size and bytes. So how many floats represent this specific vertex attribute? Two, so I'm gonna write two. Next we have, well, this went away. Next we have the type. So this is going to be the type of data that we have here. Clearly these are floats, so we're gonna type in GL float. Next we have whether or not we want them to be normalized. No, they're already floats, they're already in the space that we want them to be, so GL false. Next, we have the stride. Now, as I mentioned, the stride is the amount of bytes that we have between each vertex. So this is our first vertex, second vertex, third vertex. Clearly the stride is the size of two floats, right? So what we could write is just eight, basically. We could also write size of float times two, and that's probably our best way to kind of automate that, so to speak, and make it as, as easy to read as possible here, because we're not dealing with something like a struct or anything like that. Eventually, when we have more than just kind of a position per vertex and we start to introduce things like texture coordinates and normals, we will have a struct that makes up a single vertex. And in that sense, we could just pass in the size of that struct as a stride and that would be fine. But for now, size of float times two is how much you need to go forward to get to the second vertex. And just to, just to make that super clear, because we only have one attribute here, it's the amount that we need to go forward to get to the second vertex, not the second attribute. 
okay? That's kind of what this next parameter is, the pointer. Now, keep in mind, you can see here that it's actually a, a pointer. It's taking in a pointer, not a number. So this might be a little bit confusing, but it is still just a number. Because remember, pointers are numbers. If you don't understand pointers fully, watch my video on pointers up there because that's gonna clear so much up for you. So since this particular attribute is the first and in this case only attribute, this is just going to be zero and you can just pass it in like that. If we had another attribute, for example, let's just say texture coordinate kind of started here or something like that, then we would actually have to pass in the offset to that texture coordinate, which would be eight bytes. So we could just write eight like that. If you try and do that, you're going to get an error here because we're trying to pass in eight and it needs to be a const void pointer. The way you fix that is you just cast eight to a const void pointer. Might seem a bit dodgy or whatever, but it's totally fine. That's what you're meant to do. And of course, if you were doing this properly and you had a real kind of application or engine or something like that, you would probably have a struct to actually define your vertex. And then you could just use the offset of macro to figure out what this is for you instead of just writing eight or something like that, because that that's not a good way to go. Anyway, of course, for us, it's zero. There you go, that's it. That's how you use this function in this case, and it should work just fine. But wait, there is always, always something that I forget that you need to write to actually make this work. I always forget this when I start writing OpenGL stuff from scratch, because obviously, if you're kind of like me, you don't typically write code like this often, because this is something that you kind of do the first time when you're setting up a new engine, and then you forget about it but there is one more line of code that we need, otherwise we are just gonna get a black screen. And that is we need to actually enable that vertex attribute. So back in our documentation here, I really wish that this documentation actually said something about enabling or having to call enable. In fact, I, I don't remember if it does. Yeah, it's, it does. At the end it says, to enable or disable a generic vertex attribute array, call gl enable vertex attrib array. So if we go to this function, you'll see what this does is it enables or disables blah, blah, blah. But basically we take in, this is the function we're interested in, we basically just take in the index. The index of the generic vertex attribute to be enabled or disabled. So back in our code, I like to do this before I do the pointer. It doesn't really matter. OpenGL, of course, is a state machine. It's not like it's going to check to see if it's enabled and then not do this if it's not. It doesn't work like that. You can call it any way you like as long as your actual buffer is bound. So we're gonna call GL enable vertex attrib array and then the index we want to enable, which is zero. Okay, and that is it. These two lines of code are all you need to do in this case to tell OpenGL what the layout of our actual buffer is. And theoretically, if we had a shader, which we're gonna have in the next episode, we'd be able to finally see our triangle on the screen. Going up here, I'm just going to remove this little error here, this extra kind of float that I added just for demonstration, and that's it. So basically, to summarize, this is the code that we've written today. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. You can also go and join my Discord at discord.com, sorry, the channel.com slash Discord, which is just basically a community of people talking about stuff like this. You can discuss the episode there or you can leave a comment in the comment section below if you prefer to do it that way. I really do recommend you join the Discord though. That's a great community of people where you can ask questions about everything that you kind of see in these videos as well as, you know, get help with your code not working or stuff like that. So definitely join up there. If you really want to support the series and you want to see more videos and you want to see videos early and get a bunch of other kind of rewards, as well as I've actually started doing a hangout, a one hour hangout with all of the patrons on a specific tier where we just basically talk about stuff for an hour. Just did one yesterday, it went really well. So definitely join up there if you're interested in that. Patreon.com forward slash the channel really does help support the series and make sure that I can kind of keep making these videos as much as possible. Next time we're gonna write some shaders. It's probably gonna be quite a lengthy episode because there is actually going to be quite some code we need to set up to actually get shaders to compile and link in OpenGL. But once we kind of get that down, we'll finally have our triangle on the screen. So it should be really exciting. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Choo!